Yeah. We have some food on time, right? Sounds so, good, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whichever part of the world you are joining us from. Uh, my name is Dr. Deepaduti Roy, and I welcome you on behalf of Dharti, which is the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovation. I'm very pleased to begin the Dharti Speaks webinar series. And today's topic is Electronic Literature as GH, Perspectives from Ghana and India. We have two wonderful scholars with us today. And um, uh, before they speak, I'm just going to do a brief introduction of Dharti and then pass on to our president, Dr. Nirmala Menon, who is going to talk a little bit about our journey as well as what happens uh, moving forward. So just to give you a brief background, um, the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovation. We were earlier known as the Digital Humanities Alliance of India. And this started as a conversation between like-minded colleagues in 2016. And um, I would like here to take the opportunity of uh, talking about the Steering Committee, which consists of Professor Ashok Kurat, Professor Arjun Ghosh, Professor Maya Dodd, Dr. Ravinder Singh, Dr. Ruchi Sharma, Dr. Rahul Gairola, uh, Dr. Siddharth Chakraborty, and Dr. Padrini Remare. This is our current uh, steering committee and conversations between them in 2016 led to this um, idea that we, we must have a national conversation around digital humanity that led to the first digital humanities conference of Thai organized in collaboration between IIT Indore and IIM Indore in June 2018. And we were really surprised and pleased to have about 70, 70 sort of submissions for this event, which is a two day long event. And uh, one of the things we realized was that while in India, a lot of people don't self-identify as digital humanists, digital humanists, digital humanities works in very different ways than the Anglo-American space. But we have to talk about that. And that's really the impetus behind launching uh, our conversations in Turkey as well as the Turkey webinar series. Uh, post that, we had the Turkey Twitter conference in January 2020. And uh, we also had, before it became cool to do everything online, we were doing the 30 Twitter conference, which was led by uh, my colleague, Professor Arjun Ghosh from University of Delhi. And um, then in July, we had a panel at DH 2020, a 30 panel on towards post-colonial, decolonial digital humanities. There are a couple of people I want to mention who uh, have had a very instrumental role in taking forward the conversation on DH for 30. Uh, we at, at 30, we are never claiming that we are the first person to talk about DH. Of course, that's something that we're going to talk about in today. But I think the first open safety based conference is what happened in 2018. Um, two individuals and an organization we want to talk about is the Center for Internet and Society, Shumandra Chattopadhyay and P.P. Sneha, who have been absolutely path breaking in their contributions to DH. Uh, P.P. Sneha's Mapping Digital Humanities in India is a survey that does a wonderful job of talking about DH. And that's something I would recommend that all attendees have a look. And Shumandro and Sneha have been uh, guides for us as well. Um, one of, so one of our uh, sort of inspirations behind talking about electronic literature as DH is also the work of Dr. Shovik Mukherjee, who writes a wonderful essay called uh, India, No Country for Old Lit in, an, in a journal issue actually edited by Kwabna, who's one of our panelists today. So uh, that's something we're going to talk about today. And I want to also want to take this opportunity of uh, talking about our special interest. SIG, we have SIG on Slack. Uh, you're welcome to join that. We have a very strong WhatsApp group of over 200 members. And on the SIG, the SIGs are led by some very young DH scholars and upcoming DH scholars. I want to take this opportunity to just uh, acknowledge their work. Uh, Prakruti Manier, Manasi Nene, Poonam Chaudhuri, Shubhanjali Saraswati, Samarata Roy, Sritama Chatterjee and Shantani Saraswati, we are really indebted to the work they are putting in and we thank you for your efforts. So to talk about electronic literature, I think a conversation on electronic literature cannot begin before acknowledging the work of Catherine Hales and that seminal essay, Print is Flat and Code is Deep. And uh, she has that beautiful line there which says that literary uh, analysis over the last 500 years has been lulled into somnolence by the print culture. And it's time we decided or understood that literary text and literary analysis, the medium in which they are instantiated, that matters. So that conversation about literariness and literary analysis not being relegated only to print cultures, 
is a very important or seminal way to understand what electronic literature is. A very basic understanding of electronic literature is that it's born digital artifacts, uh, artifacts that have a digital, uh, you know, they're born digitally and they cannot be remedied into print or should not be remedied into print. And um, as many of us might be aware, the Electronic Literature Organization, which started in 1999 and has been there for the last three decades, uh, has been doing wonderful work with three volumes of electronic literature, DLO 1, 2, 3. And um, so one of, the, one of the points of connection between me and Dr. Kovna Opuku Agmeyam was that we were in the same PhD cohort at West Virginia University, where we were very fortunate to work at the Center for Literary Computing, which is one of the first proto DH centers uh, in North America. And in 2012, it also organized the electronic literature organization conference. Right, so I won't uh, uh, you know, waste more time, but I'll just pass, I'll come back to introduce Dr. Kovna Opuku Agmian, but I will pass on to my uh, president, Dr. Nirmala Menon, to have to you know, speak for a few minutes, and then we'll come back to Kovna and then Shanmuga. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Dibya. I think you know you have really nicely laid out you know, Dharti and its uh, objectives and what we try and plan to do. Right. So I think it is exciting and wonderful to have the Dharti Speak series webinar start with two, you know, wonderful scholars. So I'm really, really happy to be here and I look forward to have this conversation. And I think, you know, one of the, I, I also don't want to take too much time away from the main conversations, but I do want to say that the uh, it's a particularly exciting for us to start the series with the two of you because we do want to have a conversation about electronic literature or you know literature and other interactive media with an emphasis uh, with an emphasis on different languages and you know, in from different parts of the world so a kind of a, it it is at least for me and i'm sure for many of us a turn to uh, a multilingual DH2. So e lit as DH, but also kind of, you know, e lit from the non Anglo centric world. So the ELO volumes that Divya mentioned, you know, one of the big lacunas in that volume is that there's rarely any representation from, uh, from the rest of the world, uh, as we are often referred to. So, you know, uh, it would be exciting to see where what kind of conversations we have and what kind of exciting projects that may come out of it. Uh, so I want to thank both Kwabna and Shanmugapriya for uh, leading us on this discussion with the very first uh, lecture in the series. I want to welcome all the participants. And as an organization, uh, all of us in the steering committee, uh, Dibya and myself, are here to facilitate these conversations in whatever exciting ways that all of you want to take it to. And so welcome once again, and uh, back to you, Dibya, and we can start with the Kwabana's lecture. Thank you. Right. Um... So I just want to ensure that uh, all the attendees, you are able to use the link that I was sent to you last evening and you did not have any issue, right? Just to check whether everyone's able to join with their link, just to ensure that uh, had no issue. Okay, uh, right, right, wonderful. I just want to ensure that everyone who's registered is able to join the first day. So there might be some, some elements of, uh, Tech issues, so there was no problem. Thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi. Thank you for confirming. I really appreciate that. So before I pass on to Kovna, let me take the opportunity of uh, welcoming my very distinguished colleague and friend. And I've been very privileged to know of his work as well as be uh, in part of his PhD cohort. So I'm just going to talk. You know, I'm just going to read from the text so that I don't miss anything. So Dr. Kovna Opoku Agimian earned his doctoral degree from West Virginia University and is a lecturer at the University of Ghana's Department of English. His scholarly interests revolve around African digital literature and his research has appeared in journals such as Research in African Literatures, Postcolonial Text and Sense Public, as well as in peer-reviewed volumes. He has also guest edited special editions of the Journal of Gaming and Virtual Worlds and Hyperrays, 
and is a peer reviewer for the Journal of African Cultural Studies, Legon Journal of the Humanities, and Eastern African Literary and Cultural Studies. Beyond his uh, sort of um, general introduction, I must say that the work that Kwabna has been doing with African digital humanities is really fascinating. And um, I, I, and Kwabna might correct me, but I don't think anyone before him had been working on African e-books. So with, without further ado, I pass on the baton to Kwabna. Welcome Kwabna, and we are very privileged, honored to have you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Roy. And um, yes, he's a brother and a friend. We go way back. So I'm so glad to be here. And thank you for the kind words in the introduction. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, and welcome to the participants. I see we have about 30 something people. That's very healthy. I really appreciate everyone who has shown up here. Um, to an extent, yes, I'm one of the first who has worked on African elites. Others are working on digital humanities. And actually, the first African DH book is coming out next year by a Nigerian called Shola Adeneko, a very good friend of mine, too, and he's very good at what he does. Um, so just to go quickly, if I can share my screen for my um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, if it's not possible, I can just talk through. No, you shouldn't have a problem. I've given all the host privileges. Okay, it says uh, disabled for now, so. Does it? Okay, all panelists. Okay, just try it one more time. Fantastic, okay. So I think it um, should be working now. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, let me see. Uh -huh. I think it's working right. now. Oh. Yes, lovely. You okay. can see it. Okay, you. lovely. So, thank you. Um, I have 15 minutes, so I will rush through it a little bit. I'm just talking a little bit about um, digital humanities and uh, African elites. And it's important for us to think about working through this. And I start with a Chinua Achebe quote, which is from an African proverb that says that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, which is simply a question of perspective. And it's something that asks us to think about what it means to speak um, or, to, or to tell your own narrative. And we all know, especially coming from colonial backgrounds as India and Ghana, that if you make a mistake of allowing others to speak for you, they'll say things that don't necessarily work. Um, hello? Yeah, Kovna, we are oh. there. We can listen. Yeah, we are fine. Okay, yeah, lovely. Okay. So I'll just talk a little bit about the, some of the stuff that we are doing in Ghana, and I'll preface it by saying that we are a very inchoate group because we have a very sort of conservative mindset when it comes to African literature and African creative expression. A lot of scholars, a lot of the public still thinks about African literature in terms of the major two branches which were created or which were identified by the Nigerian scholar Abiola Irele. He talks about oral literature and print literature, which is something very similar to what Dibs was talking about when he was looking at how Catherine Hills um, sort of talked about the evolution of elites. So um, the thing about the two sort of disciplines, oral literature and print literature, is that they have coexisted together and they have worked on each other in terms of influence. So elites simply brings an, a new dimension into the space. So what are some of the things to think about when you talk about digital literature, digital humanities, or elites? It's, um, as Dibs mentioned in his introduction, it's digital born and it is contemporary. And because it's a different form of technology, it leads to novel ways of creating literature. And it's important to think about how we enter the space as Africans. So um, for the past five years, there has been an increase in thinking about how to talk about elite in Ghana. So in 2017, we organized a symposium in um, Amherst in the US. And this is um, a shot from a conference we did 
around that time. Uh, you can see me, you can see Shola, who I said is authoring the first African um, sort of DH book, and then Rhonda Cobham Sanders, who is from the Caribbean but teaches at Amherst. Um, then we came to Ghana, and you'll see uh, to the right, not, not, not very clearly, my former supervisor, who was also supervisor to Dibs, Sandy Baldwin. Um, he was very interested in expanding the reach of DH across the world. So we came to Ghana and did a workshop for students on DH in Ghana. And then we went to Benin as well. And here you see Sandy more clearly. And um, we talked a lot about how to harness the potential across the continent in terms of speaking to that death when it comes to um, DH in Africa. Um, then this is from Nigeria. So Nigeria has a Lagos Summer School in Digital Humanities. Again, the name is slightly ironic because we don't have summer in Africa, but um, sometimes these things happen. Um, we, uh, they hold it every year and they talk a lot about like the basics of DH. And now they have expanded it to have a session for neophytes and then a session for more advanced learners. And it's quite interesting. It's, it's well funded by the Germans, I believe. And it's making a very huge impact. Um, so what, what I do in my classes is to try and bring in creative people who have some connection to DH. And I try to define DH along creative lines because I teach literature. And who the person here is in one of my African literature classes. And I'll just um, back up a little bit by saying that we still don't have an, like a, a standalone course on DH in Ghana, mainly because it takes a long while to introduce something and have it accepted by the academy in the country. So what I do is I incorporate it gradually into the existing courses. So this is an introduction to African literature course. And in, instead of simply taking the different um, members of the African literary canon, I try to bring in newer artists and we do new things. So with this one, we had um, someone who uses pidgin English to write his short stories on blogs. And he came in and did a reading. So as you can see, the students are not on their phones because they're not concentrating. It's rather the fact that they have to use their phones to access the stories. And these are flash fiction pieces. So they are stories of a thousand words or less. And um, so it's very easy to read. They read them on the go. And we talk a lot about the implications of using digital te technology to respond to these stories because they are also ways of responding by comments and stuff like that. Um, another example I use a lot in class is something that I that appeared in my dissertation actually, and it's something called conceptual poetry. It's, it's not well known across the continent, and I'm not sure it's very big in India either. But conceptual poetry involves taking existing material and simply putting it together and calling it creative work. So the one of the one of the foremost practitioners actually calls it an act of uncreative writing. So um, what happened with this one was um, one writer simply took a lot of Facebook posts, put them together as a collection of creative work. And an example is here, where um, what happens is they take fictional quotes and attribute them to real people or they took real quotes and attributed them to fictional people, or sometimes they would mix it up for humorous purposes. So with this one, you can see it's a parody of the Martin Luther King quote about having a dream for racial equality. But here, the equality has to do with food. So Gary and Beans is a local dish, and he says that he wants that to stand tall alongside pizza on a McDonald's menu, then Kelly which is fried plantain with battle gold on the commodities market. And he attributes it to the first Nigerian president. So again, um, beyond the various stylistic and, and um, literary um, uh, um, the, the, the various stylistic and 
literary themes you can pick out of it. The mere fact that you have these young local people reimagining their worlds through humor leads to a lot of um, talking points, especially in terms of research. And that's some of the stuff I do. Um, another one, which is not political at all, or, I mean, or you could argue it is political, it says that the best thing any woman could offer a man is her loyalty, love, and joy love, and attributes that to St. Valentine. So again, you see the ways in which these people are using their local understandings to bring out or to critique sometimes and to show the kinds of attributions they make in terms of recognition. Um, so um, this website too is one that, that I use a lot, which is Flash Fiction Ghana. And um, there are more than a hundred pieces of work that are um, curated and accessed. Um, and there are all kinds of salacious themes, but also um, transgressive themes and themes that push the envelope. And they show how these young people are trying to speak to canon and use new ways of accessing um, information. Um, now this genre, and again, a lot of these genres are not well known or fully accepted in mainstream scholarly um, circles. So I do a, a lot to try to push them. Um, the final one I would like to talk about is about video games. And um, remember in the beginning, I talked about how African literature is a mix of oral, orality and print writing and both of them sort of speak to each other. Um, so when, when DH comes in, DH is simply following a tradition, not necessarily of replacing what is there, but of bringing in um, new ways of uh, like extending creative work in Africa. So um, these games, these are just two games that are entering the African um, video gaming space. One is called Anansi the Origin and one is called Oware and both come from oral tradition. Anansi is a well-known folktale hero, a folklore hero, while Oware is a game that has been played for centuries. It's of the Mankala tradition. Um, and the video game comes from the first Anansi story, which is how stories became known as Anansi stories. Um, there's a long thing behind it, but because of time, I will not go into it. But then you see that there's a lot of influence from Asian and um, Western comic book um, conventions. And these are simply Africanized, and then they follow the normal sort of patterns when it comes to video games. Awar is also very similar because it's from oral tradition again, it's passed through a digital space. And as you can see, it's Africanized through the use of black hands, the environment, the naming, and all of that. Um, now, in terms of DH, there are other sort of non-literary um, directions, which I would also like to acknowledge, so that it's not just about what I do. Um, we have these different uh, companies and scholars that are interested in um, being more practical in terms of being relevant and solving problems. So Mobile Web is a company that is in Accra and what they do is try to bring a DH feel to problems through coding and stuff like that. So one thing they've done has been to map out the smells of Accra. So the Accra has a pollution problem. So they have this map which shows different colors of the different scents across the city. And it's, it was meant to shame the authorities into doing the right thing and cleaning up the city. And it was all done through a DH crowdsourcing um, move. Um, and there's this one by a scholar called Jennifer Hart. She's based at Wayne State University, but she does a lot of work in Ghana. Um, she wrote a book called Ghana on the Go, which looked at the history of transportation in Accra. And then she took it to a DH uh, level. And it's very, very interesting. I, I, I encourage you to check it out if you have the time. Um, she has mapped out different um, transportation, modes of transportation in Ghana. And at the bottom left of the screen, you will see Trot Trot, Lorry Park, and Stop. 
So trot trolls are simply these public transportation buses and they have all of these um, uh, inscriptions at the back. So you see this, for instance, which is true, which means fear or respect or acknowledge. Um, sometimes you have all kinds of, um, um, how do you call it, quotes on these and they all tell different stories. Um, so I'll end just by talking about some of the new directions that we are looking at. So the three you see in there are me, Shola again, and then James Yeku, another Nigerian scholar who's also working on a book length um, uh, the projects related to digital humanities. We are all into literature, so we are kind of biased. But this picture is from the first African elite um, or DH panel at the MLA. It was one that I organized and I invited these two to join in. And, and I found um, Shola fortuitously because a friend of mine was at the same school as he was and knew he was doing stuff similar to me. So we just linked up. And then I put on, um, I put on uh, Facebook that I was looking for people like that. After I put it up on, um, I, I put up the, the proposal on, um, on the MLA call for papers site and James just messaged me on Facebook and we became friends. So all three of us through some electronic means have become very close and we are working on all kinds of projects. We just finished a panel with the African Studies Association as well, where we're talking about digital archives in African literature. Um, so these are some of the things that we are talking about when we have our conversations about extending the focus and scope of African elites to include more web created literature apart from things like flash fiction Ghana and others that are um, common in Kenya and um, Nigeria and South Africa. And we talk more about using apps and software and we want to see more work that cannot function uh, outside of a digital medium. Then we talk a lot, a lot also about interactive fiction which is something that is very close to oral literature. Then um, I know that Shola and James got, uh, they got a, um, a grant to digitize some archives in Nigeria and such projects are very helpful in this regard. Um, and I would like to end simply by thinking a little bit about how African elite would look like and um, the question of African literature itself has been very, um, it's kind of hackneyed now. And you ask yourself whether the different features in there are necessarily African or not, you know, and what counts for stereotype and what counts for identity. So these are some of the things that I think about. And I don't have answers to them yet, but I think that's why we are where we are. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant, Kovna. And I have so many questions, but I want to sort of, before I pass on to Shanmuga, I think uh, something that I want to use as a transitional conversation is the fact that um, you talked about the idea of literature as a colonial, colonial space and how African literature then talks back to it. And then when you're talking of digital literature, because digitality has inherently a techno-positivist angle built into it, that still has that productive contestation with whether we are using the tool of the colonizers. So going back to your first quote from Achille, right? So that tension is something that I would like to talk again about after Shanmuga has presented. Thank you so very much. That was absolutely brilliant. So uh, I would like to uh, invite Shanmuga. And before that, I would uh, invite, um, I'll just introduce her. Shanmuga's voice today is not great. So that's why she sent us a video, which I'd be sharing from my screen. And after that video concludes, We'll go into a question and answer session. So Shanmuga Priya, uh, Shanmuga Priya T is a postdoctoral research associate at the Department of History, Digital Humanities Hub, Lancaster University, United Kingdom. Her research focuses on the interdisciplinary fields, including literature, electronic literature, environmental history, and digital humanities. So without further ado, I'll share um, my screen as well as uh, just let me know in case you can't see. Uh, and I'll also request yeah. the code writer. Yeah. Yes, Nimana, please. She's a, she's a PhD from IIT Indore. <laughs> Absolutely. I just read from the 
uh, blurb that uh, Shanmuga Priya had sent me. So Shanmuga, you need to do a better job of promoting IIT Indoor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, right. So what I'll also request for the attendees is that if you have questions for the panelists, please drop them into the chat box. And I believe the chat box is open to everyone. And uh, I'll just share my screen and move to the. Um, give me one quick moment. If right, so is my screen visible to everyone? Uh, Nirmala Shanmuga, is my screen visible to you? Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to the team and uh, the organizing yes, team of the team. Speak C. I guess. Uh, sorry, Shanmuga Priya, I, I, uh, sound is audible, right? Yes, okay. it is. Okay, great, great. Yes, for giving this wonderful opportunity. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad to see the emerging field of electronic literature in India. And of course, this webinar, webinar is also one example of that. And without any further ado, I move into my presentation, which I titled as Interlinking Indian Electronic Literature and Indian Digital Humanities. If you look at the trajectory of research in India, it was existing even before the establishment and institutionalization of DH as a separate field through many archival projects. Project Madurai and Bijitra are best examples of that. Project Madurai was launched in 1999 and Bijitra was in 2013. Project Madurai is a collection of the Tamil classical literature and Bijitra is a digital barrarium of Ravina Tahu's works. Besides these projects, there were a few individual scholars and faculties from both private and public universities around the country by harnessing digital tools and technologies for their research and teaching. However, the several key events in the recent past indicate that DH in India is steadily moving from an incipient and invisible stage to a progressive stage. These events include our Dirti and its conferences and introduction to courses and programs and even the government schemes for public institutions such as Spark, Imprint and Impress which include DH and DH related areas as a domain and subdomain. Besides these initiatives, we can also see the increase in the number of DH courses, conferences, workshops and seminars. This map depicts all these activities but it was created in 2018. But for sure, some blanks in the map must have already filled by now. These activities and agencies bring many sources and people together to explore and experiment the broader vision of DH for Indian context. Similarly, SMS novels and other social media literature, hypertext fiction and nonfiction, flash fiction, Twitter fiction are sectors of elite but they have never been labeled as electronic literature until recently. The first generation of Indian electronic literature, SMS novels, which actually started in 2004 through the publication of the first SMS novel, Clock Room. And a few more SMS novels were also published till 2009. But the first generation of Indian electronic literature failed to create substantial creators, readers, researchers, and never received adequate attention from both public and academic. On the contrary, the second generation of Indian elite, such as social media literature, which began around 2009 and continuously flourishing till now. They have obtained attention from the public and have millions of followers, readers and creators. All these world interventions have received their new conceptual names recently as digital humanities and electronic literature but they were visible and or hidden under the rubric of humanities and digital culture, but invisible in their distinct names. So this introduction offers us an understanding about DH and elite in India as a field established their foundation. But what makes electronic liter literature as part of DH? Both originated through an experimentation with the computers in the West 
Uh, DH began with the Robert Sauce experimentation with the computers for creating index for Thomas Aquinas works. Similarly, in electronic literature was born when Christopher Stachy and Theo Lutz using computer to experiment the creative works in mid 20th century. Later, both fields were established through supports from the institutions, funding schemes, courses, and programs, and other academic and research activities of the scholars in these fields. But these may look to distinct fields based on their fundamental approach towards creativity as one is producing creative works and another is applying creative method to study works of humanities disciplines. However, elite is part of DH and even it can be vice versa, uh, which can be explained in two ways. The first one, DH can adopt the creative practice for building its method, organization and production. An elite can be more instrumental approach of DH for widening its praxis and outreach. Since DH investigates both digital born and digitized materials by using digital technologies, such approaches can be deployed to critically analyze the digital born creative works. For example, uh, this UNCO2 is an innovative interdisciplinary project. It actually uses digital fiction and other interactive narrative to bring awareness about the climate change. Another example for using DH methods for electronic literary works is James Levens quantifying the evaluation of elite with Zeta, in which he applies computational methods and tools to identify the terms of elite between ELC volume 1 and volume 2. When it comes to Indian context, such a process can be more fruitful using features of DH and elite for humanities research. If you look at the number of internet users in India, which is increasing tremendously, and of course, Indian digital humanists can harness this facility and can learn critical and creative works for the outreach of their projects. There are many ways DH outputs can be mediated through interactive narrative form of creative work. For example, uh, this hyper poetry level one by Sinjai Sinjai Kus, Ghosh and Shidich Kajakus from IIT Gandhinagar. I quote from their website, it was actually an initial attempt to bridge the classical thought of continuum theory and the concept of hypertext through the use of poems that have the subject matter of infinity as its, its goal. Another example is Batmini Ray Murray's video game Dersen Diversen. It is an example of both elite and DH because it uses technology creatively to address the social issues. The narrative is about the prohibition of entry of women into a temple in southern part of India. While these projects manifest how DH and elite can underpin each other in many ways, but what we have overlooked in digital humanities in India. DH in India started with the archival projects. Of course, these archival projects are paramount of importance for widening the access to the cultural heritage. As we are still in the starting stage, I completely agree and acknowledge that we still need to go a long way to achieve the items in our DH bucket list, such as adequate archives, sufficient digitized corpus, and technical competencies, DH pedagogy, open access tools and technologies, and many more. The recent establishment, as I mentioned earlier, gives us the scope to settle these challenges and acquire resources. But it is also important to note that these deficiencies should not be seen as a key force to preclude the need to widen our vision to incorporate, incorporate studies which can focus the transformation of culture due to digital revolution. Uh, in that case, Indian elite or in other words, other words topics related to digital culture are overlooked in the Indian DH terrain. For example, as we saw in the statistics, the digital population is growing in massive number and we can see it's evident through the millions of uh, digital memes and other creative works on social media and other uh, websites. However, these avenues received scant attention and never explored from the perspectives of humanities and social sciences. 
Hence, it is right time to take action to include digital culture in the BH in terms of researching and teaching. And also the important thing that I want to bring the attention is here that we need to be cognizant of how the digital infrastructure functions. Because most of the digital creative can be easily fall into the ephemeral category. For example, the hypertext uh, non-fiction work of paperless postcard, which I mentioned in one of my papers, is not available now. And of course, this digital infrastructure is not uh, really meant for the creative works. They are profit-oriented platform, which will update the infrastructure time to time. But negligence, technical issues and other financial issues will definitely question the posterity of creative works. These kinds of works definitely demand a quick action and intervention to critically analyze the cultural and social changes and preserve the digital cultural heritage through, through DH projects. It is hence vital to interlink the elite and DH for several reasons. But how to intersect uh, elite and DH in India? The first example I can think of for interlinking Elite and DH is the story rating machine in the novel When Rub Sweets by R.K. Narayan. It was actually published in the mid 20th century. The writer introduced a machine which can provide a formula for the story by clicking a few buttons of themes like love, revenge, and hate. And the interesting part is when the story is ready, the author can again use the machine for the text analysis of the story which is of course one of the cutting edge features of DH nowadays. What I am trying to say is that this, uh, like this story writing machine, both the creative practice and scholarly practice of E-Lead and DH have more affinity and capable of blurring the boundaries between the disciplines. Uh, such interlinking has been established in the western countries. For example, the annual conference of elite organization provides a space for both the performance of creative works and a scholarly production of elite. Similarly, some of the DH conference and workshops offer platforms for digital artists and researchers. However, in India, we have some specific issues to deal with, such as our education system rigidly follows the conventional mode of teaching and researching, which actually resulted in the lack of advanced computer literacy for humanities scholars and student and lack of arts and humanities literacy to the computer science students. Computer literacy is something like in India understood as a fundamental to obtain a job and not explore creative uh, literary and literature and art. But ELIT and DH are interdisciplinary in nature. ELIT as part of DH program will increase the critical thinking and spur the creativity for the architecture of DH. Similarly, DH as part of ELIT and any, uh, any other digital cultural program will augment the use of digital apparatus and methods to explore and comprehend the models of social and cultural transformation. Interlinking the creative practice and scholarly practice of ELIT and DH requires a common platform in the sense there should be a sufficient room for artists, critics, theorists, scholars and students in the courses, programs, conferences and workshops and even many other avenues of both ELIT and DH. At the same time, I also acknowledge many initiatives and policies which are implemented to integrate digital and pedagogy for teaching such as national mission in education and information and communication technologies. While these initiatives indeed show the evidence of engagement with the digital technologies for a higher education and digital pedagogy, such policies ignore to incorporate an interdisciplinary approach in the higher education. Only a few universities and institutions such as IIT Indore, Jadapur University, Presidents University, Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology, Flame University, IIT Gandhinagar, IIT Jodhpur and a few more universities and institutions who initiated research in DH spur student community to explore and investigate the consequences of digital technologies in literature. And of course, webinar like this one gives the hope to see many changes in the fields of Indian elite and DH in near future. I am using this browser in my couple of past presentations, but I am again using this opportunity to promote Indian elite. Shift the publication was at IIT Indoor, partnered with Ubiquiti Press UK, called for submission on Indian electronic literature. It will be edited by Professor Nirmala Menon and myself. 
so please never mind the deadline given in the browser we are still looking for uh, diverse creative works in both indian languages and english so please feel free to contact us if you have any idea or pass to someone who is really interested in and these are my these are the email ids of email ids of professor nimlavan and mine right um thank you so much sanuga that was absolutely brilliant i have so many points of intersection between you and kobna but i will actually go to the the chat box because there's multiple multiple questions that are there um one thing uh, we could take on at a later phase but i think there's some points of intersection which i want to mention which are absolutely interesting which is when kobna mentioned that there are stand not stand alone dh programs or dh courses in africa and ghana that's absolutely true for india as well in fact uh, we just had this year we had a iit jodhpur start a phd in digital humanities and an msc in digital humanities nirmala at iit indore has had a digital humanities publishing group for a long period of time but that's definitely an issue with the overall acceptability and second part before i move on to the questions from the attendees and from uh, maybe within the panelists themselves is this idea of locating social media as a site for electronic literature in in both our contexts both africa and india which goes into that overall idea of the anglo american debate between hack and yak right who makes and who theorizes so i found that really productive i'll just look into the um questions um okay So if you have any questions again um, right so i think there's a couple of questions before we move on to um, you know we have a lot of questions on our own so one question that has come up and i think it's to both panelists that can we consider blog fiction to be e literature uh, so let's like go uh, can, can we consider we... yeah yeah please please go ahead yeah yeah of course we can consider like uh... because electronic literature is something like in the beginning it always like imitating the print literature for example it's non linear and uh, like uh, uh, like we can in, uh, insert images and it's a text driven but of course since it uses the like uh, digital platform of course we can consider because it is digital book so we can consider it as a electronic literature Uh, thank you, Shanuva Kovna. What do you? What is your viewpoint yeah. on? Uh, no, I agree totally, and I would add that um, when you have a work on a website, it's not the same as printing it out on a sheet of paper. Uh, one of the reasons being that you can, apart from the interfacing with most of these stories, you can actually type a comment to respond to the question. and then the author can come in and then engage with you or other readers can come in and engage as well and you can't do that if it is printed out on a piece of paper so um and i mean uh when you are engaging with the text even the way the text is on the page can inform how you sort of engage with it right so if for example there is some hypertext um or even the alignment of the of the work can influence the way you respond to the text so it's not the same thing at all so i would call it illit but i know that that there are some purists who would keep it out and i think that is also the beauty of the discipline the democratic space where people can agree and disagree on what counts and what doesn't count but i agree i i would count it in so that's a great point because uh, this is exactly this is exactly right right there there are purists of the h who would believe that uh, you need to have a platform or a uh, tech that you created yourself or at least through some platform that is well known for creating lit like twine maybe uh, for creating works of e lit right as opposed to i i liked how both of you talked about engagement as the primary form of understanding electronic literature in the post colonial or the decolonial space right so that's a fantastic point and kobna i just want to uh, ensure that we go back to that point about uncreative uncreative writing because it talks of that kenneth goldsmith idea right and Un uncreative writing and um, you know how this idea of uncreative writing does not need to look the same in digital spaces across the world right and definitely in non anglo american spaces it must look very different so that's something that i thought was very important um i mean so i i have a few 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Any more? Please go ahead. No, I was just saying that there are some um, wonderful questions. So I think I will just let. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, one is: Should we be theory oriented while analyzing a digital text? Whoever wants to take that on, I think that's a good question. To be theory oriented. Um. So my style of scholarship is to be very. I, I to allow almost anything to go, right? Because I feel like different directions are valid. So I, I hardly use the word will or shall or should. So for me, I think that is one way of doing it. But either or regardless of the approach, the question for me revolves around the implications of the approach that you use. So if you work heavy on theory, for instance, what are going to be the outcomes? If you look at more of the practical considerations, looking at the text as a cultural text or understanding modes of engagement and so on and so forth. What are the implications, you know? And especially coming from a post-colonial background, as we all are, we think about the political implications of the choices that we make when it comes to scholarship. So for me, anything works, but I am usually more concerned with the outcomes and the implications of the choices that you make. Uh, I would you like. Yeah, Shanuga, you want to go? Uh, just if one more point, I would like to add here. Uh, since like ELT is something like very interdisciplinary, it's it's not necessarily to be focused on like one particular thing. It can be focused on like any element on the earth. So like it is very fluid in the sense. So you can use any traditional theories also. Even from some of the articles I read, like um, they used a science theory to study ELA. So it's not necessarily you have to stick with some traditional theories. If it's like very much like uh, interdisciplinary and fluid. Well, network analysis is a great example of what you just said, Shanmuga. Yeah. So we look at network analysis theory, you look at complex analysis. Uh, and I also think that, you know, I mean, just to tag on to what both of you are saying that you can theorize as a verb you know, with any kind of text, right? And so uh, I don't think that, you know, that any digital text is outside of being theorized, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to peg it into the available theories, right? Yeah, exactly. I think we can kind I of- would actually, I would actually disagree with that. I would say that I think what yeah. we need to think about is the ontology of that theory, right? So. Um, in, in this particular case, right, and I know we're just coming into a, from a, both Nirmal and I are coming from a different space, right, for me that ontology, how is that theory located, right, and then look at the epistemic analysis of that idea, so the act of being of that theory is very important for me, does it come from an oriented framework, right, does it, does it look at, uh, so then that becomes a big problem for me, right, so yeah. network analysis is fantastic, but again, does network analysis work in India and Ghana, as the same way it works in North America and UK, probably not. So I think we should we should sort of consider that. But I completely agree with you, Nirmala, that yes, conventional theories might have limitations, especially for us when we are looking at e Indian e literature. So I have a question again. Uh, do you think uh, creative writing on blogs is not authentic, uh, authentic or serious literature? That's a question that comes. It's a very interesting question, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, again, I think that the digital era puts into question what is serious and what is non-serious, you know, and it's difficult then to ascribe value to different forms or to different genres, to different creative genres and say that maybe, okay, so video games are serious, but blogs are not serious, or um, uncreative writing is not serious, but then writing a novel online is serious. I think those questions no longer hold that kind of, for lack of, of a better word, value as they used to hold. Uh, because in a digital era, creative work takes on a different meaning altogether. After all, if you copy and paste different things together, is that creative versus you, in quotes, thinking of the thing yourself? And in any case, what work is ever done in a vacuum without any influence from elsewhere? T.S. Eliot, for instance, plagiarized a lot, right? Um, uh, what's the name of this guy? Uh, Picasso. Picasso plagiarized from the Congo. Like he plagiarized yeah. the hell out of the Congo, right? Yes. Um, and I mean, 
you know, Achebe's greatest novel, Things Fall Apart, the title is from an English poem, right? So, I mean, what is creative, what's not creative, what is authentic, what's not authentic? I think those questions are explored by digital technology. So I don't even go into those questions anymore. I feel like um, the space is such that you can appropriate anything available to you and you can use it. Because India and Ghana or Africa in general have a history of being exploited by these Western spaces. You know, even I was shocked to find out that the, the jewel in, in the crown jewel in, the, in Britain is from India. <laughs> you know? I was shocked. I was like, I mean, what's going on? But then they take it as if nothing, as if it's fine. You know, but it's not fine. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but I found it, I was, I was scandalized, you know. So I'm, I, the point I'm trying to make is that the question of, authentic, of, of authenticity and the question of what is real is a question that is very political because it depends on who has the power to ask that question and to ascribe a certain meaning to that question. And that always goes against people like us. So for me, I don't worry about it anymore. I think our stuff, our cultures have been taken and used over and I mean, look at the English language. It's full of words from other languages. India as well, like they, they took so much from India and they used it as if it's British, right? And they call that authentic. Then when we do that and they ask us, oh, why are these colonized folks doing it? Oh, uh, so no, I, I, don't, I don't go there. I think it's all serious, depending on, on how you look at it. Well, Pobna, you talk about Picasso individually. I mean, cubism as a whole. <laughs> so, you know. Um, no, I, I loved the, Nirmala, I loved that idea that Kovna talked about, that there is no authenticity in the, not that there is no authenticity in the age of the digital. Authenticity itself is a myth. That is yeah. often uh, an Anglo-centric myth, right? That's, I love that. I love that. I think yeah. that's a yeah. very, very, very crucial point I'm going to take in. A few more questions, and this is a very important question, and I think uh, from, from uh, Dr. Shubha Chakraborty, and I think Dr. Shubha Chakraborty Das Gupta, who's asked this question, and I think I'll give it to Shanmuga because she mentioned this. Do you think ephemera has been accorded a new value in electronic literature? So you talked of ephemera, and what do you think about this idea, Shanmuga? Uh, is she still there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So can you please repeat the question one more time? So the question is, do you think ephemera has been accorded a new value in electronic literature? Mm, yeah, I, yeah, I actually, it, it actually brings new value, even like, like more than like uh, um, expected value. Because uh, like in this, like you know, in this in digital uh, era, we can, everything is not sure, like anything can be disappear any point of time. So like uh, the one I mentioned, the hypertext in postcard, uh, the I actually hypertext uh, fan fiction from your paperless postcard website. I actually mentioned in my paper, but yesterday uh, when, uh, when I went to check that for this presentation, it was not there. So it also questions the value but it also brings the value, like, you know, it adds to the post LED. Because print literature is something like can be, ex can be like destroyed only by the natural or any other, any other, like, you know, um, political or other issues. But electronic literature has more, more issues than the print literature. So because technical uh, issues, like if you, if you are using black. Shanuga, we are losing your voice. Block, so you might like, want to. You can, it's very easy. Uh, Shanuga, we are losing your voice, so okay. you might want to switch uh, off your video. And just switch off your video and try the last 30 okay, seconds. Yeah, sure. Now, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, like, block is something like you can start easily, but, like, you know, you have to keep in touch with that until, unless, like, you know, if you, if you don't keep in touch with, for some times, uh, Google has a rules like you know this blog has this, this many views and like you know certain contact this many visitors. If you don't visit like if you don't use the blog for like sometimes, then you, whatever the creative work you use for blog will be gone. So like you know, so this is very problematic and it also needs more attention. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Anmuga. And I'll have one, two more questions uh, from the from the box itself. One is Akanksha Goswami has said, adding to Kovner's point, I will advise to avoid conventional theories, and we can focus on the developing of new approaches and theories to study eating. I think that's an interesting point. Uh, so sort of a yeah. decolonized approach to theory, theory, theory and yes. frameworks, right? So that's a, that's an interesting, interesting yeah, so argument. Actually, Actually, I'm writing a paper right now. I just got the invitation to it. It's about decolonizing the English curriculum. So I'm talking a little bit about how like, humanities component of the class is using theory that is not necessarily a conventional character. It's all, it's all in line with this. I agree fully with this. Right. Uh, sorry, my uh, earphone battery died, so I had to switch earphones. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's a good point. And uh, Nirmala, do you want to add on to that, or any any questions on that point? No, I just was saying that you know Nigugi has been saying that for decades, right? Decolonizing the English curriculum. Mm. So uh, you know, I guess we are coming back full circle. Right. So yeah, I actually, that is the. Um, the basis of the call for, for papers. Wonderful, the, the, wonderful. Do share it with us, Kovna, that call for papers. We'd be very interested in looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and uh, I think we have one last question and we'll try and limit it. It's almost, it's past that one hour mark. So uh, Pratusha has a question which says that blogging is very much alive in case of content writing, but is blogging a dead genre as far as creative writing is concerned? So again, I think Kovna did address that to some extent when he was talking about the idea of authenticity. But if anything, if you'd like to add on to that, that uh, do you want to add on to this idea of blogging as creative writing? Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a dead genre. I think a lot of interesting things are coming out of blogging. Um, the thing about writing in general, and David and I uh, know or agree on this, unless your perspective has changed, is that anyone who writes anything is being inherently creative because the person is writing from a perspective you know, and that perspective, regardless of how objective you want to appear, is from a subjective point of view, because uh, there is a perspective regardless. So the writing, whether you are blogging about something that has happened, or you're blogging an idea or a creative work, there is creativity in there. So for me, it's a very alive genre, and it is a very important part of our corpus as a post-colonial um, space. Uh, people blog a lot because that seems to be the most accessible means of um, getting into the digital humanities space. You know, so for me, it's no, I think that's absolutely true because if you consider the current number of internet subscribers in India under the recent data set, which is 560 million people, but if you look at that, uh, nine out of 10 people use their internet on mobiles, right? So you have to understand the kind of affordances, the digital affordances. Right? You cannot expect DH or ELIT to look the same way in Anglo-American here as in Anglo-American spaces because the affordances is completely different, right? So, sorry. I want to add, as, I, as you said, I just want one point here. Sure. Like, in the, like, sure. Even in the Western context, it is not even that genre because though they have like many very interactive and sophisticated electronic literature, so unlike us, um, they like there like the value has been like leaving into like secondary or like even the primary category, but always like interactive, sophisticated elite always in the top. But when it comes to Indian context, like Indian or Ghana, as you mentioned, this blog and the social media is very much available. Any common man can just quickly like use the blog and social media on the spot. They can just flow free fill flow their creativity. And, and also there is another issue like the computer literacy that like can allow you to use very much like you know sophisticated software for, for creating interactive that is still like we little bit far beyond maybe some some digital artists in somewhere like in India or like Ghana maybe using interactive uh, 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 creating interactive digital literary works but they might not call it as digital literature so it might just like you know uh, lying in their desktop or some like you know a computer so the awareness is also another issue i want to bring here absolutely absolutely i think that's very well taken so um i think it's about an hour or so so we'll keeping in 
mind the time and since we don't have any more questions um i think we can uh, let the panelists go because i think it's been um it's been a wonderful and enlightening session because and more importantly it has if in nirmal and i keep arguing that uh, dh is rhizomatic in india right dh doesn't have a teleology like a primary or a secondary root but it grows up like ginger in different places and it's very important to acknowledge those lines of flight right so what you've done today both uh, kobna and shanmuga you've shown us some of those lines of flight and those intensities where they gather and i think that allows us for more questions than answers and that's very important so again i want to greatly appreciate dr kobna of kogmian and dr shanmuga priyati for taking the time to do this uh, for all the attendees who are attending i want to appreciate you for coming out and attending the session the session is being recorded so we also will be put on the dharti youtube channel so that you can access it there as well and i would like to give the closing words to dr nirmala oh no, i just want to say thank you very much kobna and chanmuga that was such an amazing wonderful conversation i cannot think of a better beginning to our series lecture series right divya absolutely absolutely uh, so thank you both so much for your time thank you to all the participants and look out for our youtube you know link and let's let's get the conversation going and let's have you know conversations in solidarity you know with africa with other asian uh, you know scholars and that's how we you know we move forward absolutely and nirmal i don't think a conversation about indian and african elite has ever been initiated into the indian literary space yeah. before this so at the point of sounding a little braggy i think uh, i think this is something that dharti can take pride in right so i think that's something we are very proud of thank you so much people we are very grateful for your time and we'll we'll keep in bye. touch thank you bye everyone take care bye everyone bye, bye.